It's a common misperception that heart disease mainly plagues men. But in reality, it actually is the number one cause of death among women worldwide. According to the World Heart Federation, heart disease claims 8.6 million women's lives every year, killing more women than all cancers, tuberculosis, HIV AIDS, and malaria combined. Here to give us more insight about why this is happening and what preventive measures women can take to decrease their risk of heart attack and stroke is Dr. Kathy Magliato. She's one of the few female cardiothoracic surgeons in the world, and she's currently the director of Women's Cardiac Services at St. John's Medical Center in Santa Monica, California. Dr. Magliato also is an author whose recent memoir, Heart Matters, chronicles her career as a female medical pioneer and her commitment to helping women fight and survive cardiovascular diseases. Dr. Magliato, thank you so much for being here. Great to have you. Thank you, May. Thanks for inviting me. Well, do you mind if I call you Kathy? Absolutely. All right. Well, Kathy, I know that there's a, an unusual story as to why you decided to become a cardiothoracic surgeon. Mm -hmm. And I guess it has something to do with the size of your hands. <laughs> what happened there? To, to, to some extent, yes. I have uh, huge hands. I can palm a basketball and hold down 13 keys on a piano. Wow. And, and for me, it was kind of a sort of a fateful a day that I fell in love with the human heart. It was a very Grey's Anatomy day, I like to call it, yeah. because I was an intern, a surgical intern at the time, just like on Grey's Anatomy, which is a show about surgical interns. So I showed up to my first day as an intern, and they told me, listen, this is a tough year to get through, and the only way you're going to survive it is if you do two things. I thought, well, two things. Okay, I can <laughs> do two things. They said, stay out of everyone's way, and don't kill anybody, <laughs> and you'll be just fine. And wow, I thought, okay. wow. I think I got this because I think I can stay out of everyone's way and I hope I don't kill anybody and I'll be fine my first year. So one day very early on I found myself standing in front of the operating room board that shows all the cases that are there for the day. Okay. And I'm minding my own business. I haven't killed anyone. It's 7 a.m. <laughs> doing pretty good. And a nurse grabs me and she throws me into an operating room and she says, oh my God, Dr. Netter needs you stat in OR7. And I thought, me? You know, he needs me. I'm just, you know, the lowly intern supposed to be minding my own business. Right. And they chuck me in this OR, which is complete chaos, right? People are running around. There's instruments dropping on the ground. Oh, uh, it's yeah. just total chaos. And in the middle of all this is an operating room table with a guy on it with his chest opened up and blood is shooting up and there's a surgeon <laughs> up there. And this surgeon, who doesn't look up at me at all, just yells over, get some gloves on and get up here. And I thought... Up where? Did he know you were an intern? <laughs> I don't think he knew who I was. Okay. I think he thought I was a nurse because okay. I sort of, you know, I was a girl and I was, right. a, you know, they thought, oh, get that nurse up here. And, uh, you know, he says, get up here. And I thought, up where? Where all the blood is shooting up? Because if I go up there, I'm going to be in everyone's way and I probably will kill someone. Right. Okay, because that's not what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> but, you know, I found the courage and it, it just it takes a lot of courage uh, to be in that life and death situation. But I found the courage and the nurses were great and they helped me to glove up and get up there and help him. And that's where these big hands came in, as you point out, um, because he said, reach in there and hold the heart steady so I can sew this hole shut. He had a hole in the heart. Wow. And I reached in and held the human heart the human beating heart for the first time. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's just incredible. So I said to this surgeon who's in the middle of saving this life, I finally found my voice and said, um, excuse me, uh, do you get to do this every day? And he said, do I get to do what every day? Again, never looked up at me because he was saving somebody's <laughs> life. And, uh, he, and I said, you know, do you get to, you know, hold the human heart every day? And finally he looked up at me and he says, of course I do. I'm a heart surgeon. And he puts his head back down and he just saves the patient's life like I had said nothing. And honestly, May, for me, that, that was, was it. it. Wham. That was when it. he said, that, of course I do, I'm a heart surgeon, I realized that I could touch the human heart every day. And that one moment in my life led me to be a heart surgeon. Here's the thing, Kathy, uh, being a heart surgeon, that's mm -hmm. a world that's really male dominated, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, even to this day, you're one of very few uh, heart surgeons in the world that's yes. so accomplished. Yes. So that could not have been easy when you were starting out. You know, it, it, it wasn't. And, I, and I, I will tell you that I was the first and only woman to train at every training program I trained at, whether it was in uh, general surgery, cardiac surgery, and eventually in cardiac transplantation, heart transplantation, because I trained in heart and lung uh, transplants as well. Uh, it didn't deter me at all. I think it actually made me want to do it, because the more most people told me, oh, you can't do that, 
the more I want to do it. That's okay. my typical, uh, that's typical for me. <laughs> but, uh, but you bring up a good point. If you look at the statistics of women in heart surgery, um, in the entire history of heart surgery, which dates back to 1948, there's only been about 200 women that have ever taken and passed their boards wow. in cardiothoracic surgery. So just like a lawyer has to pass a bar exam, a surgeon has to pass a board exam. And, right. and of those 200 women, you know, very few of them are, you know, either still living or still working as a cardiac surgeon. Many, many are retired. So, you know, the numbers are quite small, but I would never let that deter you from going into something that you want to do or again or thank you goodness you be. didn't because yeah. again you've you know made such a difference yeah. in the world of heart surgery and for women thank you um, here's the thing it's not just on your end that mm -hmm. there's you know a difference in men and women but it's also female patients right. that seem to be treated differently mm -hmm. by the medical world I mean you see these reports coming out constantly where women are saying, wow, I'm not really being treated mm -hmm. or misdiagnosed mm -hmm. or dismissed for how I'm feeling. Why mm -hmm. is that still happening? Yeah, that, that's what's sort of so incredible about medicine is a somewhat of a bias. And I think yeah. at least to speak of it in terms of cardiac disease, and by the way, I loved in your opening the statistics that you showed right. about you know, the number one killer in the world of it's women. Stunning. It's, it's stunning. Really right? stunning. It's stunning, right? It's stunning. I don't think people yeah. realize that it's the number they, one killer. They don't get that. And I'll tell you, if you fill a room full of women and you ask them what's your number one health concern, what, what do you think they all say? Breast cancer. Right. They all, right. you know. And it's because we've done a great job of building awareness around breast cancer. You know, but, but to your point, again, initially about the show, that this segment that we're doing, we're here to raise awareness about heart disease in women. Mm -hmm. So to your point about women being underdiagnosed or dismissed, you know, it, it's really a twofold thing here. So I think one of the main reasons why we see so many women dying of a disease that's 80% preventable is that women don't understand the risk factors, they don't recognize the symptoms, mm. and honestly, we're all guilty of this. We're so busy taking care of everyone else around us that we just forget to take care of ourselves. Right. We ignore it. We ignore it. So yeah. we run out and we get our mammograms every year. But when was the last time a woman got a heart checkup? Right, right. You well, know? let's then talk about the specifics of how it yeah. is different between yeah. men and women because symptoms, uh, treatment, it's all quite different mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. So let's first start with symptoms. With men, we all kind of know that, oh, they start feeling chest pains, left right. arm starts aching, and things like that. Yeah. But with women, it's a little bit different, isn't it? Yes, yes. And I'm hoping that's something, something that we show on my, on my television show because what we've seen on TV, and I'm not knocking television, but we see in the media, we see that, you know, that, that guy who's shoveling snow and then he clutches his chest and his neck veins are distended and he drops to the ground. It's yeah. very dramatic. That's what we see on television, but that's not what we see in women. In fact, 50% of women, half of all women, get no chest pain whatsoever. So if, if you're out there waiting for chest pain to be your first symptom of heart disease, that's actually not the right thing to be looking for. Right. And in fact, the, the most common way that women present with heart disease, unfortunately, is not with chest pain, it's death. Sometimes wow. for women, the first sign that we see is actually women showing up dead to the hospital in full cardiac arrest. They having, having had no symptoms or having symptoms that were so subtle that they ignored them. For example, uh, mm. the number one symptom that women get is actually fatigue. Now, I oh, mean, gee, you and I, right? Every day, right? <laughs> You're probably exhausted just sitting here, right? <laughs> no, uh, so the number one symptom we get is fatigue. But, but I, have to, I have to preface that by saying that it's an uncanny kind of fatigue. It's a fatigue mm. that a woman says to themselves, gosh, I don't know, I don't know what's wrong. I, I, I'm tired all the time. I'm, I'm eating right. I'm sleeping. I'm exercising. But something isn't right. And, huh. and the beauty of women is that we know our bodies, right? So we kind of know when something's wrong. But right. again, it's just that fatigue being the number one symptom, that can be pretty nebulous. But if you are having fatigue that you cannot explain and it's persistent, you really should go have your heart checked. Just, just like you, if you found a lump in your breast, you'd go and get a mammogram. It's the same sort of thing. It's just not as obvious. So, but here's what's interesting about that, yeah. though. Yeah. What if a woman was feeling this way? They yeah. went to, she went to the doctor and said, I'm really tired. Mm -hmm. Is the doctor really going to say, let me check your heart? You know, I think we're doing a better job of, of making doctors more and more aware that the disease in women is different, it presents differently, and it's more subtle. Okay. Um, but I will say that there is somewhat of a bias, as you said, you know, again, in the, the earlier part of the question where you said, you know, some people, some women are just blown off. I, I will say that it's important as a woman to be your own health advocate. 
okay? Mm -hmm. We all advocate for our husbands, we all advocate for our partners, we all advocate for our children. We have to do it for ourselves. So if you go to a doctor and you don't like the answer that you're getting or you feel like you've been dismissed or you feel like you haven't been worked up as well as you think you should, right. you go get another opinion. Right. Be right. your own advocate, because guess what? You'd do that for your child, wouldn't you? If you took your child to a doctor and didn't like what you heard, you'd probably go find another doctor and see if you got a secondary you know, opinion about it. Yeah. So, so that's one of the things. The other thing to think about is, um, in addition to fatigue, the combination of fatigue with shortness of breath, that's really an important combo for women. So mm -hmm. going to the doctor and saying you're fatigued, hopefully the doctor can elicit maybe some of the other symptoms that you may not even understand, which is that combo of shortness of breath and fatigue. Okay. But again, a symptom that women will go, well, you know, I'm short of breath, but it's because, oh, I'm overweight, or I haven't been working out, or, or stressed yeah, out, stressed or out. something. All right. that stuff. So right. we gotta watch that. So fatigue, shortness of breath, okay. those two are biggies. And then the other things to always report to your doctor are any kind of pain. You mentioned like jaw pain, arm pain, that often mm -hmm. men get that as well, so yep. that's important. Women un also get something uh, like an upper abdominal type pain. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of women are actually misdiagnosed as having gallbladder symptoms and whatnot because they have this upper abdominal pain combined with nausea. Okay. Um, but again, this constellation of symptoms really becomes important. And unless your doctor specifically asks you about those, you may get blown off because yeah. you're not able to give the correct history that we need that triggers those extra tests and things that we can do to diagnose And you. again, it's about yeah. You know the knowledge, getting getting the message yes. out there, getting the yes. information out there. Yeah. Um, let's talk about a more on a global scale because, mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, 8.6 million Huge. women worldwide. Yeah, that's crazy. That's a crazy number. Crazy. Um, wh what are the countries that are suffering the least and mm. suffering the most? Well, I can tell you two in particular that have come up uh, recently in some of the literature is uh, South uh, South Africa, hmm. actually has a death rate from cardiovascular disease that's 150 percent of the US, which is astounding. Wow. And in addition, Brazil in particular, 75%, they have a 75% huh. uh, increase in the rate of death of cardiovascular disease over the US. But you know, no country is immune from heart right. disease. As you mentioned, it kills a third of women worldwide. And, and the most important statistic I think that you gave that was enlightening to me is combining cancer with TB with HIV, HIV, AIDS, which we malaria. hear about all the time, yeah. and malaria. Yeah. And you combine those together, and it doesn't even come close to the number of women dying from heart disease. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Kathy. Thank you. And you're, the great work that you do, saving lives. I mean, really, talk about a purpose yeah. that you have in life. Well, it is my honor and my privilege. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.